Hello, welcome back. A little bit of a different intro. Yes, it's winter. And yes, it's snowing. And yes, it's cold. One of the fun things about being retired is I don't have to go anywhere. Get enough food for at least a week or more, depending upon how you stretch it. And enough uh, beverages to keep me very happy for a lot longer than that. So let it snow, let it snow. But when there's nothing to do outside that you want to do, time to look inside and time to look at pens and time to look at pens that say, restore me. So we have one here. I put this pen away a couple years ago. And I think it was one that I was planning to restore, but somehow it got lost in the shuffle. It is a Parker. And it is a Parker Challenger. It's a small pen, but it has all the parts intact, nothing of major wrong with it. And, you know, nice threads on, on the cap and interesting nib. And what makes it restorable is the fact that the section comes out. There's some the original sack still on it, so I'm the first one to restore this since it was put away who knows how many decades ago. So the restoration will start and I'll let it snow. Well, I'm done with my first phase, which is cleaning and polishing. And I'm using a, a plastic food tray from, uh, it was actually a Thai food takeout that I got a few weeks ago. Troy Laplante uh, suggested using these uh, takeout food trays to use for restorations. You can keep all the parts together. They don't roll off the table. So kudos to Troy and great idea. And I, I love getting ideas from other people. Hopefully I can contribute some of my own. The resin came out very nice, nice green. We got some good sunlight coming in. I just polished that top of that button filler. You can see that little extension there. In theory, I could pull out that button at the bottom of it. It has cut out, so it's meant to snap in and out, but from looking on the inside with a light, it looks good in there, so there's no need to take something apart that is already in good shape. The cap also came out well. And what's nice is, you know, the Parker design where they use a, a screw-in insert to hold the cap in place. A design used by a lot of pen manufacturers. And I'm just happy the way everything cleaned up. I think it's very nice that there's a brass insert there. So you got the plastic screws and this finial going into that brass insert to hold in this brass clip. The pen cleaned up well, so I'm happy. So then we get to the section and it is, it does have a transparent window there. Um, this is a breather tube, which should extend up through the sack, so that's going to be replaced. But where the real issue comes in is the nib. And hopefully, it's you can see that it's missing that tipping material on the left-hand tine here. And hopefully it's coming up uh, is that slit is off-center. So when they cut that slit in, the left side was probably very thin, not sustainable, so it probably broke early in this pen's life cycle. So I'm going to knock this out with my uh, knockout block. And I'm certain I have a replacement Parker nib. Hopefully I can get one with the same engraving that this one has to replace it. So that's stage three of the restoration. Well, I did find a nib that will fit perfectly in the pen. And it looks like it has a kind of nice medium, maybe a little stubbish end to it. So I'm really happy. So we're going to put a bladder in the pen. I've decided I'm not going to put a breather tube in there. I don't have one that fits, so I just cleaned out the one that's there. 
and I'm not certain how that breather tube would work because I'd expect to see a hole somewhere else and you don't see one. So I think it'll work fine. Most of my vacuum attics or sorry, most of my button fillers don't have a breather tube in them. I thought I'd show you how the pressure bar works in this. If you push down on the button, you'll see it pushes that pressure bar down and it's pretty flat. And that's because of how the design is. There's that little ledge there that holds one part of the pressure bar in place. When you press down on this, it pushes out the other piece. LED light makes a, a nice display on here. You can see, hopefully, at the very end there, there's a, a number 9. So this was made in uh, 1939. Uh, nice imprint. I put talc on the sack, and when I inserted it, the nib and feed were not in the section. I'd taken them out to replace the nib. So I used this wooden dowel inside of the sack. So when I inserted the sack, I made certain the sack stayed straight, didn't get twisted, and extended cleanly uh, throughout the barrel. It's a technique that I saw Steph of Gramia Pens use, and Whenever I can assemble a sack pen and I don't have the feed and nib in there, I'll use this to make certain that that sack stays nice and straight. There's that uh, clear ink window section. I was able to get most of the ink out of it by a series of cleaning operations. And the nib fits very nicely. So I'm uh, happy and, uh, you know, we got nice movement on the button. So we're going to figure out what kind of green ink to put in this and, and ink it up. The uh, imprint comes out very nice. And you can see that seam from the celluloid as we follow it around. It goes right through the middle of the parker. Keeps going. Keeps going. And there is where it eventually meets the end of the barrel. The Parker Challenger is a small pen. Here we have it in relationship to a pen BBS uh, 308 slash 266 Wasky and a Pilot Metropolitan. And it is significantly smaller than, than those two. We'll give you the dimensions and the weight so you can have those as absolute numbers. Posting, again, they're pretty much a different size. There's a number six well and nib on the pen BBS, so don't let that gold nib uh, concern you. As you can also see, the nib on the Parker Challengers on the small side, kind of what you would expect from a tier two pen. Just a little close up of the business end, so you can take a look at that section. The threads are fine, so you can really hold the pen anywhere. But it certainly is a small nib, small section, small pen. In addition to restoration, the history of the pen, how it fit in to the times it was made, to me is, is very interesting. So if you go back to the early 1930s, America was in the height of the Depression. Parker was finding that its high-end dual-fold line wasn't selling as much as they would want. So revenues are declining, so their attempt is to come out with lower cost pens that can bring the revenue back up. And that's really where a series came into play. The Challenger was one of them. There was the Parco, there was the Parquet, and other ones that they put out there. They used a lot of the same celluloid resins that they would use in their vacuumatics or their dual folds to make these pens but they cut corners in some other areas and that's how they ended up with these different types of pens. So this is the one that we are looking at in this video which is restored and that now writes well with that uh, replacement nib. Here's an earlier version as you can see it has um, a different type of resin in it. It also has this kind of nickel plated trim which in my experience that does not hold up very well. This is also a button filler, and this has a, a date on it, 
and we'll see if we can read that. It also has a nice nib in it. Pretty much of an extra fine there. And here's another version. This you may recognize from my restoration video. Uh, the resin still looks very nice. The brass has started to oxidize again, so that might need a little bit of a polish on it. But this is again another interesting type of resin, and it's a lever filler. Then we have this pen, which I don't think I've done anything in a review, which I find very intriguing. But part of the cost cutting measures is getting rid of that cap finial, which has this, you know, a lot of parts to it. And you just have a press in clip. Nice Art Deco design, nice three bands here, lever fill. It also has a parquet nib, it's branded parquet. It's probably on the fine side and you can see that 37 date, third quarter of 1937. And as usual they also made a pencil variant to go with their pens. This has an interesting uh, modification to it. Looks like the finial was lost and they replaced it with a screw. And this is also that nickel plated trim that I'm not a fan of. And just to put things in perspective, here's a vacuumatic from a similar time frame. I find it interesting because it has that clear resin. You can see the breather tube in there. The other thing this has is the lockdown filler, which was one, one of the earlier vacuumatics had it. I'm certain that design was to make the blind cap a lot smaller, to make the pen more petite, and to make a larger filling area here without making the pen larger. So when I do my research on the internet, I find parquets that you can get at reasonable prices. Here's some relative eBay auctions that I found. So if you're interested, just do a search on, go into the Parker section on fountain pens in eBay and do a search on Challenger or Parquet or any of those. You'll see a variety. If eBay's not your uh, best way of buying, then you could go to Peyton Street Pens. It's also been good. I bought a few from them and I've never been disappointed. Uh, and they have a very changing inventory so you can always uh, go up there regularly and check. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a perspective and how this pen came to be, why Parker made a low-end pen. And I think they were very successful at it, at least from my perspective looking at it, you know, 90 years later. Here's the ink I decided to put in. It's ink I got during my uh, purchase from Robert Oster, Ink Art Ink. It's a color card. It's a dark green. Doesn't appear to have any, you know, minimal sheen, but certainly it's a dark green. But what's really, to me, intriguing is the chromatography. Not a lot of green there. In fact, uh, more blue and certainly an awful lot of pink. So I have to admit that's one of the stranger chromatographies that I've seen for an ink that when you look at it, you wouldn't have guessed it. Before we actually put nib to paper, we need to talk a little bit about what I needed to do to get this pen to write. The original nib had an issue with one of the tines. So I put in this replacement nib, which looks like a strict replacement, but when I first put it in, the pen wouldn't write. It would write a few words and it would stop and then maybe you could get the, the ink flowing again, but certainly inconsistent. So after thinking about it for a while, I pulled out the nib and feed. Thankfully it was able to be pulled out so I didn't have to take it apart and knock it out. And then I looked at how the nib and feed interacted and they looked fine. So apparently when putting it into the section, the nib had come away from the feed and therefore there was a gap, which is, I think one of the reasons a lot of pens have trouble writing or writing consistently. But where I have it adjusted now is pretty much as far down on the nib as you can get. And that's one of the adjustments that you do if you want a pen to write wetter. This is a pen I would definitely post. It feels good in the hand posted. That's still a small section, certainly a little bit smaller than I like. But let's see how the nib writes. It 
This is one of the nicest Parker nibs, vintage Parker nibs I've ever used. It's smooth and it really lays down a wet line and it's nice and soft and it's bouncy. And as you saw, you can starve the feed out. I did open up the feed when I did my nib adjustments. So other than replacing the feed, I think we're going to get the most flow that we can out of it. But if you don't push the pan and if you write slowly, it works fine. So I enjoy this pen. I really appreciate uh, the challenges that it gave me. I uh, really fixed it last night just before I went to bed as I thought about what I needed to do to have it consistently write well. And this is an interesting ink, as we saw from the chromatography and the color swatch. It's certainly a dark green. Um, very dark. So another vintage story that we were t that, that I shared with you. I just enjoy my vintage and thankfully I have a lot of examples and I'm able to restore pretty much most pens, especially sack fill lever pens or button filler pens, um, vac fillers and other types of exotic filling mechanisms are not something I work on, but I am slowly trying to learn. So thank you for watching. may have many great writing experiences and enjoy all of them and enjoy putting ink on paper regardless of what ink, nib, pen, or paper you use. So we've reached the end of this video. Have a great day. And as we see, yes, it can get starved. So that would do that a lot, but it would take a long time for it to come back. Now it comes back pretty quickly. One of the interesting parts of vintage. We still may need a little bit of more work on that nib, but at least it's much more usable than it was a week ago. The challenges continue.